Scott Horton, and um, I want to make sure to tell everybody to tune in at 9 o'clock tonight, uh, Karen Katowski's new show, American Forum. She's going to have as her guest Al Lorenz, who some of you may remember is in trouble with the military. He's been, I believe he's been court-martialed, I'm not exactly sure, um, over writing an article for LewRockwell.com called Why We Cannot Win, and um, he's going to be her guest for, I believe, both hours tonight. Uh, that's from 9 to 11 Eastern Time. Also, uh, this show goes out to Richard Pryor, who died today. Funny guy. Uh, I don't know if you add them all up. I wonder how many hours of my life I spent laughing listening to Richard Pryor. It's a lot, so this show's for him. And a uh, uh, travel tip, a warning for those traveling for the holiday season. Uh, federal air marshals will kill you if they feel like it, and then they'll try to force all the witnesses to say they heard you say the word bomb out loud. Uh, so be careful on your holiday travels. And now introducing our first guest today, Larissa Alexandrovna from uh, RawStory.com. She's a journalist, columnist, and poet. She's the managing editor of Raw Story and is the author of a historical novel called Odessa Mama, which I don't believe is about West Texas, and The Culture of Lies, which is about the manipulation of language. Welcome to the show, Larissa. Hey, how are you? I'm good, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, so Karen's on after this? Uh, Karen's on an hour after my show. I'm on from uh, 6 to 8 Eastern Time, and then she comes on at 9 Eastern Time. Yeah, we've been, uh, it seems like we've been uh, side by side all weekend. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. oh, really? How is that exactly? Well, she wrote a column about uh, the Constitution, and so did I, and we were on Huffington Post, and we were running back to back one another. Oh, that's cool. Well, so now minds. we're back to back again. That's funny. <laughs> great minds think alike, I guess. <laughs> And and her show is really good too. You should uh, tune into it. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, now so I'm kind of interested about this book. First of all, um, the culture of lies about the manipulation of language. Uh, I guess that's uh, kind of along the lines of George Orwell taking words out of the dictionary so we don't think them anymore and that kind of thing. Sort of, and it's not even it's not out yet, but yes, yeah, sort of. It's not so much. Um, it, it's kind of replacing a euphem using euphemisms. Mm-hmm. Or hate speech, but there's nothing in between. So, for example, if you replace every time someone said spin with a word, what it really is, which is lie, mm-hmm. then the connotation would be completely different. Um, and the discourse would be completely different because it would, it would, uh, people would understand it more. A spin is so fabricated, is so unreal that it doesn't really, um, speak to anybody. No one connects with it. So it, it, even though they might use it or say it because it's been said so often around them, it has no impact. It's yeah, it's, sort of, it's, it's kind of permissible to spin something. It's not okay to lie, but it's okay to spin. Right. And so what we've done is we said, okay, it's okay to spin, which really means lie. Um, it's okay to, um, uh, you know, uh, say, for example, flip-flop, even though that means nothing. It's just a, a branded term that means literally nothing. You know, nuanced thinking is absolutely okay with with rational creatures, um, but yet flip flop somehow is this insult. Or we've gone even further where we've taken adjective, or we've made adjectives out of a person's name who otherwise has no meaning in the real world. For example, Michael Moore. I don't know if you've noticed this kind of sort of series of. Um, Attacks, calling people Michael Moore. Sure, Even that's what they called uh, Martha when he came right. out in November. Right. Now, what what does that really mean? What does it mean to be a Michael Moore? A big, fat communist? <laughs> well, he's not a communist. Okay, he's fat. So are they saying Martha is fat? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's just silly. You're right. And it's the same thing also, you know, when you get to insurgents and terrorists. It's okay to kill terrorists, but insurgents might have a legitimate grievance, maybe. Uh, we have to leave it there for this break. We'll be right back. It's the Weekend Interview Show. We're talking with Larissa Alexandro... Alexand- Damn it. All 
right, my friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton, and I'm talking with Larissa Alexandrovna from rawstory.com. I'm sorry about messing up your name on the other side of that break there. Uh, hey, before, before we talk about Plame, oh, by the way, everybody, we're going to be talking about Plame and the Niger Gate and the Fitzgerald investigation and all that, but I want to spend a little bit more time on the language thing. I really like what you say about euphemisms. Basically, I guess as George Carlin says, you bury the pain under jargon. And right. so, so a lie isn't a lie anymore. It's just a spin. And um, I guess as Carlin's best example, shell shock is now post-traumatic stress disorder. And so <laughs> nobody cares about it. Whereas when it was shell shock, it was like, hey, that's somebody's son who's shell shocked and he needs help. But now, oh, you have the post-traumatic stress disorder, huh? Boo-hoo for you. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a sanitization or, you know, kind of creating an atmosphere of a, a very sort of, um, sterile language that no one can connect to and therefore cannot react to and cannot use in any honest discourse. And so you have this whole new lexicon and it's, it's, you know, we've become inundated with it to the point where we even use it and don't realize that we're using it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I just call Michael Moore a commie, but he's really not. He's just, I just call anybody to the left of anything a communist, but that's ridiculous, you know? Well, you know, I mean, I'm to the left of what, exactly? <laughs> <laughs> anybody to the to left, of, left of, uh, of me is a red. Is a red? Well, you know, I'm from a uh, former communist Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, so I'm hardly a communist. Uh, trust me on that, so... <laughs> well, but, you know, I'm just agreeing with you. Basically, I mean, the point is we throw words around, and in well, reality, yeah. words mean things, but oftentimes we play it off and, and uh, kind of fudge the truth with language. Well, even like communism that. doesn't mean anything because the reality is communism never survived uh, its birthing in, in academia, you know, as all intellectual uh, structures or philosophies. Once it leaves the 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 safety of uh, the academic world, the ivory tower, and goes into the real world, it becomes something else. And so communism, co communism never survived. What existed in the Soviet Union and everywhere else is, is a, a form of totalitarian government, but uh, I would hardly ca you know, call it communism. I mean, it, with, you know, in, in the traditional definition of what communism is. Okay, I could go, I could, uh, I could go with you there, I guess. Although I think that uh, people who are kind of utopian communists often say that any example of communism not working, that that's not the real communism. Real communism would have worked. At least you're, you seem to be saying that, no, there is no real communism except in the head of uh, some academic. Well, right. I mean, the, the reality is that in order for there to be real communism, everyone would have to be equal, and human beings aren't structured that way. Could you imagine everyone being equal? Is it... It, our society doesn't work that way. We always need someone to govern. And when they govern, they have a certain amount of power. They're no longer equal to everybody else, no matter how much we like to say it is. So it's, it's, it is a utopian uh, concept, and as all utopian concepts, they're not realistic and they're not probable or even possible, I don't think. So, yeah, I mean, so when they, people say communism, I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you talking about... Um, it just means statism, uh, supposedly on behalf of the poor. That's all it means, mostly. Yeah, but but in reality, it, it's been statism at you know at in, run by the military. Yeah, <laughs> yeah know, exactly. It's fascism, unless there's corporate interests involved. Right. All right. Yeah. Hey, let, let's get let's Sorry. get to the plain main thing here. Now, I mean, we could sit here and talk about this all day. Only I don't know exactly how interesting it is to anybody but you and I. Um, the uh, the plain name thing, I get all excited about this, even though it's really not that big of a deal in the end to leak the name of a CIA agent. What do I care about that? But, wait, 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 wait. Are you serious or are you joking? Oh, well, I, I really don't think there should be a central intelligence agency at all. I, okay, uh, but, but given – okay, okay. I mean, do you want me to comment on that or you want to just keep going? <laughs> well, sure. Go ahead and go ahead and, and take it from there if you want to. Say whatever you like. Um, well, I, I, I agree with you. I don't believe in, in any sort of secretive body. Um, nothing nothing uh, honest grows in, in dark corners. Um, be that as it may, there exists a CIA, and there are laws that govern uh, the handling of classified information. And so because there are laws, then uh, we have to take into account that the leadership of this country violated laws. Right, and um, really that's the point, is that the right. laws do apply to us. They're supposed to apply to them, too. And right. 
And really, the the other reason that this is such a big deal to me is because it's to me it represents the tip of the iceberg, and that when we uh, dig a little bit deeper into uh, the flame story. It seems to lead to all kinds of other interesting things. And I frankly would like to see, I don't know, at least a half dozen people of the uh, Bush in the Bush administration, at least from the first term, uh, I'd like to see them go to prison for I some of the things that, that. that I believe that, uh, you know, where they have actually broken the law. Um, we all know lying a country into war is a hallowed tradition, but it seems like there are particular uh, uh, statutes in the penal code or whatever that they have broken. Right. And so, you know, I'm for as, as many people in government going to jail as possible. So that's why this plane thing is so interesting to me. Well, I mean, I, I'm in particularly, you know, I'm interested in criminals going to prison. And uh, given the amount of criminal activity uh, that's spewing out of this administration, which I don't think I've ever seen anything like it, in this country anyway, um, I, I just don't see how they're going to go to jail because you have to remember that their jury would be uh, a jury of their peers. Given their status, that would be the Senate. And their judge in the case would be the uh, Supreme Court, uh, would be, what's his name, Roberts. So um, yeah. I, I just don't see that going all that smoothly for justice, unless it's a Justice Sunday, and it's going to go smoothly for them. Uh, sure. Now, Fitzgerald's mandate, though, is to follow the, the crimes related to the Plame affair wherever they may lead, right? Well, he hasn't. I mean, and why I, I do you know, say that? Well, I mean, I know what he's doing in terms of in the next week or so. I haven't reported it yet. Okay, fine. I understand that. But I, I feel really that every time it gets close to Dick Cheney, he sort of veers. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's quite apparent what is going on. It, it, there, it doesn't take a, you know, a, a nuclear physicist to figure out how this came about, why it came about. Um, how this administration has over and over silenced its uh, anyone who disagrees with them, and especially whistleblowers, using everything from uh, archaic laws like the State Secrets Act uh, with Savelle Edmonds to using um, uh, fear tactics to absolutely committing crime. And this is a big crime because I don't think people realize that it's not just that a CIA agent was outed, big deal, who cares? It's that as a result of the outing of the CIA agent, we no longer can adequately track the sales of um, arms in the Middle East. And anyone who was working with, this, with the cutout group, with the uh, Brewster Jennings, which is, was the cutout that Valerie Klein was using, Anyone working with that group um, as a CIA officer or asset abroad was immediately terminated, neutralized, arrested, what have you. And so Brewster Jennings was basically, I guess you're implying, the center of the CIA's efforts to track uh, the nuclear black markets? Yes, correct. Okay. And uh, specifically nukes um, is my understanding. Why is, it, why is it that the underlying crime of leaking her name was not charged in Libby's indictment? Well, you know, you're, I can't read Fitzgerald's mind, and I'm not an attorney, so it's hard to say. Um, I, I think my understanding um, of how it's been explained to me is that this, that particular statute is very difficult to prove. And as any prosecutor, he wants to go with what he can prove, no matter what he suspects. Um, and... Now, again, I don't know the, uh, the, this, this law very well. I'm not an attorney, and I certainly don't know what's in his head. But in my opinion, I disagree with him. I think there's more than enough evidence here. There's no question. It seemed, I guess in his press conference he said that the question uh, to him was he would have to be able to prove that Libby knew that she was, uh, she was a covert operative rather than just, uh, say, a desk clerk at CIA. Right. But the, the reality is, I mean, although it's not, you know, there's there's, a lot of information that hasn't been reported yet because there's certain facts that first have to be obtained that are relevant and such. At least what we've been able to put together thus far in our own internal kind of timeline and, and even the timelines now out uh, on the web and such, you can see that there is intent. And intent to out a CIA officer, a covert officer, and 
where she was working within the CIA is, in fact, the dark side of the moon. It's the, it, it is the covert section. And to go from Wilson to Plame, they would have had to really ask around. And there's very few people who would have known Plame's identity and what she was working on, even if they sat right next to her. Um, so they... I've, read in, I've read in some of your articles that um, uh, it looked like, I guess, uh, a guy named Frederick Flights, who was uh, working for uh, John Bolton in the State Department, that right. he was sort of the liaison between the CIA and the State Department, and he was probably the go-to guy for John Bolton. Yeah, and, and he, he wasn't so much of the liaison, but he was on loan from the CIA to John Bolton to be his chief of staff, which is astonishing because why would you need a CIA officer to be your chief of staff? What was Mark Grossman's involvement in this? Uh, I can't really get into that right now because I'm, it's an article I'm working on. So um, let's just say he was involved. That's correct. Do you have any reason to believe that Fitzgerald is uh, looking at in, indictments over in the State Department? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. Now, if he isn't, I don't know if there's going to be deals. But uh, there are people in the State Department that are being looked at, and not the least of which is Stephen Hadley. In fact, I'm surprised he's not arrested already. So I don't know, mean indicted. I mean arrested. And uh, uh, Wilmser and Hannah have both already flipped turned state's witness, right? Right. They, they flipped a, a while back. All right. We'll be right back, everybody, with Larissa Alexandrovna from rawstory.com. Friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton, and I'm talking with Larissa Alexandrovna. I said it right that time without stuttering. From <laughs> RawStory.com. And uh, it's a really great website you got there, Raw Story. I like it. I've been, uh, you guys have all kinds of scoops and inside sources, it seems like. Yeah, it's magic. What can I tell you? I haven't, I, I have to say, I can't come up off the top of my head with anything that you guys got wrong that I found out later, so... So know, far, your record with me is spotless. You know, it's bizarre because there's a lot of people who have posted that we reported these bizarre stories, and that and and we hadn't. And I don't understand where this is coming from. But you know, yeah, you read so many websites in a day; they all run together. Right, and it's, <laughs> but it's bizarre. It's truly bizarre. Even. Um, um, you know, like Dana Milbank of the Washington Post was like, they reported this and this and that, and uh, on Keith Oberman's show, and I'm sitting here watching it thinking, no, we didn't. Where did you get that? And, you know, it's bizarre. So, well, one thing you. you did report was that Hadley was Woodward's source. Right. And then when he denied it, you came out and said, uh-huh. He didn't deny it. Oh, he didn't deny it? No. Oh, I, I thought it was a very carefully worded Oh, kind no, of no, 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 no. We're back to language manipulation. Uh-huh. Yeah. There was no denial. It was a non-denial denial. A non-denial denial. Yeah, right. Um, it, let's put it this way, okay? There's two stories with the Hadley story. By the way, everyone, Hadley is the National Security Advisor of the United States. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right, and at the time of the leak, mind you, he was the Deputy National Security Advisor. Right. And, and he's all over the map on every issue that has to do with all of this, the leak, the war, everything. In any case, there's two really big uh, kind of interesting points here. The first is this. We reported that Hadley was Woodward's source, and... Within, I don't know, 18 hours, there was a report that an anonymous White House official had uh, that had basically said, that, uh, denied that that was true. So I called, the, or we emailed the reporter on the story and said, you know, this is bizarre. Um, you have a single White House anonymous source reporting that someone in their, in their administration, and you're using this as a denial? How, how is this, you know, how is this uh, acceptable? Um, Shouldn't the person in question go on the record to deny this if it's, you know, tr- if it's not true? And the writer was very comfortable with this single source. The next day when we called the National Security Council to get a comment for uh, a follow-up article we were doing, we were told to say how we were to write the comment down to the s- syntax. I'm not kidding you. 
and we were told to attribute it to a White House official, which we, we, would, we would not do. And... I, you know, I start, and then the NSC spokesperson said, well, that's what we told the other journalist. So, basically, one can presume that the journalists who ran the um, denial piece got their denial piece from an NSC spokesperson, attributed it to a White House source, and to make it sound, I don't know, maybe perhaps more um, definite somehow. But there was no denial. Whatsoever, the spokesperson uh, would not speak for him, would not uh, have him go on the record, would only say that he denied it to his staff. What, if anything, can you tell us about your sources? Uh, not much, really, nothing. There's, there's more I, than one of them. Yes, I can tell you there's more than two of them. Okay. And that's all I can tell you. Um, you know, I mean, it's. Uh, I, you know, it takes a lot of guts to do what uh, real whistleblowers do. I don't mean leakers like Karl Rove and, and the gang over there, but real whistleblowers take a lot of risks. And so it's absolutely, you know, uh, my responsibility in guarding uh, every aspect of who they are and what they do. All right, so the big news is about um, Fitzgerald's second grand jury that he's impaneled. Right. And uh, it seems like uh, some of the chatter, I guess they call it, is uh, that we're to expect uh, another indictment or two soon, uh, right. presumably Karl Rove. Is that your information? Well, here's the thing. Um, last time when we reported that Libby and Rove would be indicted and what they would be indicted on, Karl Rove sort of threw, a, a, you know, a, an 11th hour you know, some sort of trick. You know, he threw Viv, uh, Vivica Novak at at the at the prosecutor, which now we find out had nothing to do with anything. Um, How's that? That it has nothing to do with anything, Vivica Novak. Explain because her, she 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 was deposed, and she said that, and she testified, and she said that uh, the conversation took place a great deal earlier. So it contradicts the story that was spinning. Spinning, notice spinning, mm -hmm. um, on the, you know, from the Lusk and Rove team. Um, so it was, it really is, it wasn't relevant to anything other than uh, I now question the credentials of this attorney because he actually changed the date to try to save his client. And I wonder, I'm not an attorney, but I certainly wonder what kind of uh, ethical uh, law or ethical standing or ethical um standards, rather, that uh, he may have violated, if not legal standards. So I don't know. Uh, but but when we had reported that both of those uh, guys would be uh, indicted, both Libby and Rove, um, in the 11th hour, there was, uh, there was this, you know, here, take this, look at this, and, you know, spare me type of thing. And so now I'm staying clear of reporting anything until the 11th hour has passed. All right. <laughs> yeah, we don't want anybody to get off because you reported that they weren't going to. Huh? No, because yeah. I don't want them to come back later and say, you were wrong, you did it again. Right. But, All but right, wait, wait, wait. Hold it right there. We'll be right back, everybody. It's the weekend interview show. Welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Larissa Alexandrovna from rawstory.com. And we're talking about the leaking of the plane name and Fitzgerald's investigation and all that kind of thing. And I want to bring up the White House Iraq group. Uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but Andrew Card said something about you don't introduce new products in August. And so they were going to wait till the spring. And apparently they got together this White House Iraq group made up of the chief of staff, Andrew Card, Carl Rove, Karen Hughes, uh, Mary Madeline, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Stephen Hadley, Scooter Libby, um, two guys named Callio and Wilkinson that I'm not familiar with. Wilkinson, oh, you should be familiar with him. Do you remember the Brooks Brother riot? The Brooks Brother riot? No, yeah, I'm during not... the, the 2000. Uh, oh, yes. The uh, in Florida. Yeah, uh -huh. The, the Fa Mob. The, the Brooks Brothers riot. That's hey, I didn't name it that. <laughs> okay. 
But, I, I, you know, that's a, that's a really accurate. Yeah, um, I do remember that. that well, now, tell people who don't remember what exactly Okay, happened. basically, during the recount uh, in Florida, um, during the 2000 election, um, there was this uh, sort of mock mob that showed up and was banging on the doors of where the ballots were being recounted, and they were, um, you know, showing up in numbers, and there was this big outcry from the citizens and blah, blah, blah. turned out they were all Republican operatives. And the reason it's called the Marx Brothers Riot is because they were they all came in suits and ties or, you know, suits and long white sleeve shirts type of thing. Mm-hmm. So this guy who put it together, he literally, it was just like some hack who put this together, was promoted <laughs> to uh, national security, uh, to be on the National Security Council. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely qualified, right? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what they need, right, is partisan hacks to get their thing Well, out. right. And then yeah, he went cool. on to run the PR for CENTCOM abroad. So that's who, that's. Uh, so Hughes, Rice, Hadley, and Wilkinson out of the White House Iraq group have all been promoted. Libby's been indicted. Hadley's been promoted. Rice has been promoted. Yep. yep. There, in fact, there isn't anybody who hasn't been promoted out of that group. Oh, well, oh the other guy. Is, Calio. He's a congressional liaison, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know a lot about him. No, Card Card hasn't been promoted. He's just in his spot. Well, you know, you by know. all accounts, everyone I've talked to, believe it or not, Card is somehow innocent in this. Oh, so, he was sick that day, or? <laughs> <laughs> well, he he put together the group, and then, but he wasn't. According to what I've been hearing, he wasn't really involved in the day-to-day operations of the group. Okay, so now when you say innocent in all this, you're implying then, I guess, the, the White House or Rag Group is where they hatched this scheme to out Valerie Plain. Well, right? the, they didn't only hatch that scheme. I mean, the White House or Rag Group is the modern-day version of the plumbers. I don't know if you know who the plumbers are. Sure, during, yeah, from Watergate. Right. Um, and if you remember, G. Gordon Liddy, Libby and Liddy, huh? Yeah. Um, Liddy, you know, put together this plan to drug anti-war leaders and... Um, forcibly um, remove them from the country, deport them. Uh, and he put together these uh, PSYOP, you know, like these, these bizarre plans that it sound, sounded almost like it, he was putting together an intel community. Yeah, well, and broke into Dan Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office and all the rest. Right. But he wanted to do more. He wanted to do serious, uh, hardcore um, CIA kind of intel stuff on Americans. It was It was surreal. Um, he didn't make it very far uh, in, in terms of uh, at least most of his plans. However, this group did. <laughs> they weren't tasked with just selling the war. They were tasked with silencing, and I mean silencing it for you know, in whatever way they could. And were, mind you, these are all people who have national security clearance. That means they have access to all sorts of stuff, and I would not be surprised if they are if they were putting together some damning information on uh, the people who would disagree with them and, you know, to silence them. Um, but Joe Wilson is, and Valerie Plame and all of these things, they're not the only victims of this group, you know. Um, I, I really believe that, I mean, from all, you know, my understanding is that, um, you know, there's Scott Ritter, um, David Kay, uh, any number of people who disagreed with this administration, a wig was sent to, you know, as an attack dog, if you will. And it's, it's, it's very disturbing to me that there's this secretive group running out of the White House with national security clearances for people who don't um, really have, they haven't earned them or appreciated the right to have them. And this group is, is literally doing political dirty tricks on that level. It's it's really astounding to me. There are some who have speculated. I guess the, the conventional wisdom is that they wanted to shut up Wilson, so they leaked the name of his wife because they wanted to look like nepotism, right? His wife got him his, got him the job, so he's right. mama's boy, so we shouldn't listen to him. Except I don't that believe that. He, he, had already, uh, he had already been out. seems like the damage was done there. And there have been others who speculated that uh, perhaps uh, Libby and, and his uh, f- co-conspirators um, had another reason for outing um, Valerie Plame herself and perhaps her CIA front company, Brewster Jennings. And when you told me earlier that Brewster Jennings was, was basically the center of the CIA's um, monitoring of the world's nuclear black markets, um, makes me interested to think, like, what other motivation they might have had to out Valerie Plame besides uh, just making her husband look bad. 
No, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I'm certainly in agreement with the latter interpretation. I think there's more to it. And if you look at the series of events, they, they really started long before um, his op-ed. You mean the, the series of events leading to the outing of his wife? Yes, they, uh-huh. started, they started what they called a workup in March of 2003. Um, and they, it, she wasn't out until July, so you have to wonder um, what, what had prompted them. And all throughout that kind of time frame, there's these bizarre series of events that I can't really explain and that seem questionable to me. But what I, I, but I do agree that um, the, the, the reaction to uh, Wilson's op-ed and the, the front story, and I do believe it's a front story for why they had done with, you know, why this was done, doesn't make any sense because you have to remember that these guys have basically ignored everything and with great success. They've ignored the Downing Street memos, which I think is by far more damning than some, an op-ed by an ambassador that nobody really knew. Right, and, and by ignoring it, it basically just went away, right? Dro- dropped out of the news cycle and nobody right. really cared. Right, I mean, you had like letter signatures for the Downing Street memos. You had legal actual documents that no one was denying and these guys you know were able to no nah, we don't care plus the other thing is that IAEA had already back in March discredited these documents right very publicly so what's this overreaction why um, if you remember they immediately pulled the 16 words that they, uh, the president had used in the state of the union just pulled it i mean which uh, to me looked like um, a really um, serious reaction. I mean, it exposed them a great deal. And so, yes, I, I, I agree. Especially because they backtracked and said, well, the British still insist that it's true and they have secret evidence we can't tell you. Right. Well, blah, blah, blah. The, the reality is well, it, all of this is bizarre because if, if you even go back to um, the uranium, the claims that uh, Iraq was trying to buy uranium from Niger, You've got to ask yourself, you know, just and one of the, uh, the the most obvious questions is Iraq already had uranium in the country under IAEA seal. If they wanted it that badly, they could have just used the amounts that they had, which were um, much more than the uh, than the documents uh, were saying that he was purchasing. Well, sure. And if Niger was trying to sell Iraq uranium, how come we weren't rattling our saber at Niger? Well, them a terrorist be, state. well, no, no, we'd be rattling our saber at the French because they own all the yeah. mining. Yeah. Well, but notice how we went after the French before the war. But the French are the ones who poo-pooed this intelligence that we had from day one. And who do you, the campaign against the French and Freedom Fries, it's, it's all very Whiggish, is it not? It's, it, well, it definitely seems like it, although the congressman, Walter B. Jones, that renamed French Fries Freedom Fries has recanted and regrets it and wants the troops home by next October. Yeah, well, and, you know, I just, I, you know, you can't recant so many dead bodies. Yeah, well, so. a few tens of thousands. So what do you think, uh, do you have any idea what Brewster Jennings was actually into and what might have been the real motivation for outing that organization? Well, I do have some ideas. The problem is, <laughs> I, and, I, and as, as I told you earlier, and when we spoke before the uh, the show, um, this particular story is the one that's the, the, basically the grail. And while the mainstream has essentially been asleep for a year, so um, you know, the few of us who have been doing reporting have uh, been working without the, the feel of their pressure. Now they've awakened. <laughs> mm-hmm. And now they're, you know, at the end, uh, at the last mile, they are uh, really going after this story, and so I really want to be able to put it out in in a way that you know isn't spin um, before they get a chance to put it out in a way that is. Well, yeah. microphones open. Go right ahead. <laughs> what I mean by that is, however, <laughs> oh, uh, in writing on your website, yes, I see. Yes, on rawstory.com. Okay. But I can tell you that I do think the two are absolutely related. I can tell you that without doubt, and I can tell you also without doubt that Fitzgerald believes they're related. Okay, let's see if I can chase a lesser grail here and see if I can get your help on that. Let's see if we can uh, follow the Niger uranium documents to their source. Good luck. 
<laughs> There's uh, a quite a uh, labyrinth of uh, red herring trails surrounding those Niger uranium documents. Do you think anybody knows who actually forged them in the first place? Uh, a lot of people have theories as to who forged them. It doesn't really matter, I think, in the end who actually forged them. Oh, no? You don't think so? No. I think what matters is it only matters if they were an American or a representative of an America of America, either internally or you know abroad. Right. See, that's what I'm getting at. Um, well, I mean, I know we've talked about this before, and I, I just, it's not. You know, you're heading in the wrong direction. I know what your theory is on that, but you know what my theory is on that, and I, I believe it's uh, much more. Well, it's pretty close to home if you're pointing to the Ladine group. Yeah, well, Michael Ledeen has been named from a few different directions, uh, including by Philip Giraldi on this show, which basically, basically I kind of uh, got a mm-hmm out of him when I said Ledeen's name. And, and that was his best information. He wasn't saying he knew it firsthand or anything. And, yeah, it's impossible but, to but really... But La Republica has come back and and basically said at least, I think, that the that the documents went at least back through Ledeen on their way to the National Security Council when they were on their way from the east to the west, right? It's it's really, I'm telling you, it's absolutely a maze because they all, you know, the same publica- Italian publication reported um, that it was Carlo Rossello who had hand-delivered the documents to the um, uh, to the embassy as opposed to the journalist uh, Berba. Right. I can't recall her first name. Elisabetta. Elisabetta Berba. Yeah. And, uh, Yet everyone I've talked to claims it's it's Burba and she's yet to deny it. So, um, right. I think she even said that she's the one who took him to the to the right. Embassy, I mean, right? she. Oh, but it doesn't make any sense. Why would she be in the possession of these documents? Who is she? I mean, what is going on here? Well, let's rewind a little bit. There's a break in at the Italian embassy in was it New Year's January, Day 2000? No, January 2001. Oh, 2001. So the, yeah, they got uh, yes. Yep. So it. still, so basically, if we can assume, and maybe this is going too far, but if we can assume that these documents were forged with the intent of using them to lie the American people into war, mm-hmm. um, if we can assume that, and now I guess the FBI says, oh, no, this guy was just trying to sell some documents and they could have said anything on them, but if we can assume that, say, Ladine was involved at all in their creation or, or uh, other Americans involved in trying to get us into Iraq, then... That date of the break-in, when the when the time stamps came up missing and that kind of thing from the Italian embassy, or the uh, Niger embassy in Rome, mm-hmm. uh, that's pretty important, being that it was nine months before the September 11th attacks even happened. Right, but but when was the uh, PNAC uh, mission statement written, or when were, you know were the various um, position papers written? Although. The- Although, you know, rebuilding America's defenses isn't quite an overact like well, let's forging con- documents, though. Well, let's consider that the, that the main architects of that document, not just the signatories, but the actual main architects of that document, are the very people who are in very sensitive positions right now. Absolutely. Well, and David Woomser, who uh, has been promoted to at least one of Libby's jobs, he's the author, the principal author of A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm, written for Netanyahu in 96 that proposed getting rid of Hussein as the first step to uh, Israel uh, having regional hegemony there. Are you reading my article? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I remember report, reporting that in the Wormser piece we did. Yeah, and his wife is an interesting character, too. And because... Pearl and Fife are both signatories on that document as well. Well, so is Jeb Bush. Oh, are you kidding? Jeb Bush's name is on a clean break? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, on the on the PNAC mission statement, absolutely. Which became the claim break became the mission statement. Oh, I see. Yeah, his, I mean, it's it's a who's who of uh, who's in the government now, and um, so it's one thing to I, you know say, well, whoever broke, if it was Americans that broke in, that somehow you know precedes 9/11, that shows intent for 9/11. I think that's where you're going, right? Oh, no, 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 not necessarily intent for 9-11, but just intent to go into Iraq in, 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 to such a degree, you know, that they would uh, commit break-ins and forge documents and, and that kind of thing. Well, right, and you have Paul O'Neill saying on day one in the cabinet meeting that was the, the, right. the, that was the first thing they were discussing. On you know on 9-11 and the days following, immediately following 9-11, that was what they were discussing also. Incidentally, Wormser... Um, 
a few days after 9-11, wrote a memo saying, let's hit it, you know, I, and I don't have it in front of me, um, but it was in my article on Wormser. He, he, he's, he wrote a memo that um, basically said, let's hit Iraq, Venezuela. They were, you know, everybody, but, but he says al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we have to say them for last so that there's still somebody to hold up right. as the boogeyman, I guess. Right, well, and we also know that Wolfowitz on September 12th, according to Richard Clark, well, I guess we can't say we know this, but according to Richard Clark, at least, on September 12th, Wolfowitz was there pushing the Judy Miller, Judy Miller slash Lori Milroy conspiracy theory about uh, Saddam Hussein being behind the Oklahoma City bombing and all that kind of thing, too. Oh, uh, you know, I, I mean, it, 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 the, the reality is what's, what the irony here is, is that it was never about Iraq anyway. Iraq was supposed to be a drive-by shooting like Afghanistan was. And then they were, the, the real target has always been Iran and then Syria. And then Saudi Arabia. Well, let's not tell the, our, our friends over there that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Although I think they suspect that may be true. Um, sure. Well, remember Richard Pearl invited uh, that former LaRouche, Lawrence uh, Mirwick, who said that Iraq is the tactical pivot, uh, Saudi Arabia the strategic pivot, and Egypt the prize. That was in the I wouldn't say Egypt war. is the prize. I'd say um, uh, controlling uh, the oil in that region, is, in, the, in the full region, is the prize. Probably. All right. We'll be right back, everybody, with Larissa Alexandrovna from rawstory.com. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton, and I'm talking with Larissa Alexandrovna from rawstory.com. Hell of a great reporter. I recommend you go and look through her archives there. And now let's see if we can try to tie all this scandal together in something sort of rep uh, resembling a neat package. Um, the Office of Special Plans in Doug Fife's office seems to be sort of the center of this neocon network. And... Um, in the right. government, anyway, yeah, yeah, right. the epicenter. Yeah, I guess besides the Weekly Standard. <laughs> it's almost it, it, <laughs> right. It's almost like a, it, it's bizarre. It's almost like a, a virus that uh, you know started there, and then everyone went on loan to other departments. Sure, and you know Bob Woodward uh, reported. <laughs> speaking of Bob Woodward, uh, uh -huh. he reported Colin Powell saying, "Hey, they set up a separate government over there." He called it Fife's Gestapo office. And uh, apparently to somebody like Powell or Armitage, uh, these neocons really got away with an internal coup and stole the government away from the official processes, as you described with the, the White House Iraq group. You basically have the plumbers running the whole government. Well, you have, uh, no, I mean, you, I wouldn't say you have the plumbers running the whole government, but you certainly have people with top security, given top security clearance in order to do uh, political dirty tricks. And imagine the kind of... Uh, Damage that could be done with uh, top security clearance, um, but Wig is it, Wig is separate from OSP in that OSP is the the actual um, strategy group. It's the policy makers. It's the um, the guys who who would who were tasked with creating a war to sell, and Wig was tasked with selling it. Mm -hmm. Also, besides the Office of Special Plans, there was a little two-man unit, at least at first, that was, I believe, uh, Woomser and Hanna were the counterterrorism evaluation group, right? Now, you mean the, uh, the net assessments group? Is that the group? Um, no, no, there's a different one called the counterterrorism evaluation group. Oh, that, that must was... be one I haven't found yet, huh? Oh, oh, yeah. I know that they were part There's of that, that uh, Rody and... you got to start reading antiwar.com. <laughs> I do read antiwar.com. <laughs> okay. But um, we re we read raw stories, so. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Um, so that we have that in common. Um, we read each other. The no, I hadn't heard of that. I mean, there was the Office of Net Assessments. It really doesn't matter what you call it. The reality is, there was an office in the CIA called the Office of Special Plans. A while, you know. Well, sure. And Larry Franklin, who's already pled guilty to being an Israeli spy, worked no, there. No, no, no. He hasn't pled guilty to being an Israeli spy. Oh, I'm sorry. To passing secrets to Israel. Right. I mean, if we're going to be accurate, let's be accurate. But is he an Israeli spy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> that's not what he pled guilty to, and that's not what he was charged with, necessarily. Okay. But, uh, Fair enough. But let's consider where Franklin was. Well, he was in Rome with Michael Ledeen at all exactly. the meetings with Gorbanifar and the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution. Ah, so wait, Michael Ledeen's there? Well, who else is there? 
Rhodey. Yeah, Hill and, Road. Right. And then uh, who's aware of these meetings? Hadley. Well, mm-hmm. no one else is at the time. They were unapproved. They were um, uh, the CIA station chief was not made aware of them. Uh, but Hadley knew. And that's really interesting to me because if you remember, Hadley's part of WIG. Uh-huh. And he's tasked with selling the war. You have the national, Deputy National Security Advisor. Oh, wait. We only got 50 seconds, and we got to bring up the treason word because Chalabi was there. And according to, I believe, the third La Republica article, it wasn't uh, Iranian dissidents. It was the mullah's men who were there with Chalabi and yes. these neocons in Rome, right? Yes, yes. And since the, yes, and you are quite correct. Because Iran is part of the axis of evil, of evil right. therefore an enemy of the United States. Anyone giving aid and comfort to the enemy is... It's, it's, committing treason. I yep. believe that's uh, Article 2, Section 4, right? Okay. All right. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Larissa Alexandrovna from rawstory.com. Everybody check her out. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Sure appreciate it. All right, everybody. We will be right back with my friend Anthony Gregory from the Independent Institute. Hang tight.